Thank you. Uh, when I talk at conferences, I oftentimes get scheduled right before lunch, and I can promise you we will end on time. We're going to do um, R and Spark here, uh, continue that topic, uh, and talk a little bit about doing uh, sparkly R. So uh, I'm a solutions engineer for our studio. I talk to our customers uh, every day. And we hear a lot of customers talking about the huge investments that they're making in Hadoop and in big data. In many cases, these customers have a number of data scientists that work on their team uh, with R. And they know about um, Spark. And they're really excited about all the developments that are um, going on in Spark. What those R data scientists are used to is uh, you know, all these packages that we've talked about today, uh, great ways to share their insights, uh, some nice visualizations and uh, maybe even using some uh, interactive notebooks. So what we've tried to do at um, our studio is to recognize that uh, this group of analysts uh, using R really want access to Spark, and we've built a package that gives them very easy access to that. So the idea here is if you, know, you want to use Spark, if you're invested in Spark and you're using R, you can get started uh, today. It's very easy to get going. Um, you can use the full power of R with Spark. Um, the benefits to the data scientists is that the, um, you know, they can have access to their Hadoop cluster. They have this familiar Spark, um, you know, this SQL syntax that is probably already uh, part of the institutional knowledge. They have uh, access to this built-in machine learning, um, and they've got nice performance to do interactive data analysis at scale. These are really great um, developments that the um, Spark has um, you know, brought to the data scientists. And a lot of the data scientists that we see out there are extremely excited about you know, leveraging those in their um, analytic worlds. So what does our package do? The Sparkly R package um, has a couple of uh, features I want to call out here. The, the first is that it's fully integrated with the IDE. That means that when you install this package, it's very easy to like, see what's going on. Um, you can pull up the Spark UI. You can see the data sets. It's got a nice uh, first class citizenship in the IDE. And uh, the IDE, by the way, is used. If, if you're new to R, uh, then you need to know that the IDE is used by almost everyone in R. So we felt like that was an important part of um, the Spark story. Um, the second one is that we gave it a, a back end to Dplyr. And that's important because a lot of people are already using dplyr as syntax to do their data manipulation in R. We felt like it would be much easier for them to just work with the Sparkly R if they could use that same syntax. It leads to better coding practices. It's a little bit easier to read. And there's some conveniences in dplyr that you know, we're interested in um, um, continuing. And the third one is building an extensible framework around the package. And I want to talk just briefly what that extension looks like. Uh, we're saying that you know, if you want to build other packages on top of Sparkly R that leverage the APIs, then that's very easy to do so. Here's an example where you uh, count the lines in a file using uh, invoke and the count command. You can put that function in your own package, and you can install that alongside of Sparkly R to do your own work. We're going to be talking a little bit more about extensions when we talk about uh, modeling. So that's kind of the, uh, the motivation around building that package. Um, uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, what that looks like in regards to doing data science. So um, Hadley Wickham and Gary, uh, um, <laughs> Garrett Groleman wrote a book called R for Data Science. And it's new. It just came out. And they, in there, they talk about this uh, kind of data science tool chain that has three parts, accessing the data, understanding the data, and communicating the data. They're not inventing this. They're saying, like, this is what we see people doing. We're trying to you know, explain it in a way that makes sense and relate that back to the R tool chain. So um, what I'm going to do today is talk about how this also uh, would be useful with um, Sparkly R and use in Spark. And to do that, I'm just gonna, going to quick, very quickly step through some of these um, pieces in case you haven't um, seen all the things that we're going to do in the demo. Uh, the first one is importing data. There's a lot of tools in Sparkly R to bring your data into uh, the Spark um, application. You can bring data in via S3, um, HDFS, uh, from a file, or even from R. The next one's about data wrangling. And I've already talked about dplyr. Uh, here's an example of what dplyr syntax looks like at the top. It has these uh, what we call verbs and pipes. 
and it gets translated to Spark SQL. And this is an important thing to call out um, around Sparkly R. What we're doing with Sparkly R is we're translating all of this dplyr syntax into Spark SQL, passing it into the Spark APIs for computation on the cluster. That's opposed to actually running our commands on the cluster. We're not doing that here with Sparkly R. We're just translating things into the Spark API and making that a very uh, seamless and good experience for the end user. The third one's about visualizations. Uh, ggplot2 is a very popular visualization package. You'll see it pop up um, more and more frequently in the news. If you follow 538, they produce a lot of these diagrams. Um, what we're going to do in the demo is collect our data uh, and then uh, do visualizations in ggplot2. Uh, modeling becomes a little bit more complicated here of a story for the data scientist because oftentimes um, data R is chosen to do specific models. I mean, I don't really know anyone that's using R for data science that's not got some favorite you know, model techniques. So when you look at models, we're already coming to the table knowing, okay, we have some preferences or some biases. What types of tools are available to me in Spark? And there's three that we're gonna talk about. One is Spark ML, um, and then the next one's H2O, and, uh, and then there's R. And finally, we're gonna uh, talk about communicating this, uh, this information here via uh, notebooks, um, R Markdown, and then uh, a sharing platform. So uh, we do support notebooks in our Studio IDE. We're trying to get that message out. Not everybody's aware that that's been out for about a year now. Uh, the R Markdown format can be used to translate those notebooks into very nice reports and documents. And then uh, we have a new product called RStudio Connect where you can host all of those documents so your colleagues can uh, you know, collaborate with you or uh, reproduce your research. Great, and with that, I'll toggle over uh, to the demo. All right, so this is the RStudio IDE. If you've never seen the RStudio IDE, uh, this one is running in the browser because it's running on um, RStudio server. And RStudio server is the same thing as your desktop IDE, it's just on a server. And this one runs on a driver node um, on top of an eight node um, uh, Hadoop cluster uh, in EMR running um, Spark. And I want to go ahead and get started by um, it, you know, installing these packages, which I've already done, and then connecting to the instance. So I'll go ahead and run this code and explain what's going on here. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load up all my packages. And you notice here I'm loading up H2O and the R Sparkling extension, which I'll use later, um, as well as uh, Sparkly R. And the next thing I'm doing, I'm setting my Spark home, and then I'm uh, setting this configuration. This configuration is a list of tuning parameters that help my Spark application run um, with greater performance. There are a lot of tuning parameters and it's very important that you tune your cluster. Um, I can't overemphasize the importance of tuning your cluster. Um, and we have some recommendations on our help site if uh, you're just getting started with how to do that. Uh, the next thing we do is we're gonna um, uh, connect here to a Yarn client mode, because I'm using Yarn and uh, version 2.0 of Spark, okay? And so you don't, this case I'm doing this in text, but you can also do this um, via the connection window where I specify exactly how I wanna connect so that GUI can walk you through that process. And when this comes up, let me refresh this, um, you should be able to see all of the data in your Hive Metastore. So this searches for all the data that I have access to in Hive and then allows me to take a look at it. So if I click this table, this is my raw data. And it will uh, give me a, a top thousand records of this data. And the important thing here to note is that um, these data are not in R, these are actually in Spark. So that's, that's um, a huge benefit to um, our studio users. I also wanna just pause this because I kind of skipped over this around our business model. We have paid products. You're actually looking at the paid version of our studio server pro but there, we have an open source version as well um, that costs no money, and we have, uh, um, and Sparkly R is also freely available on CRAN. So everything we're talking about today um, has, is uh, free and open source. Um, if you need paid tools for whatever reason, we supply those as well, but um, everything here is free. All right, so um, that's um, the connection. Let me scroll down here and talk a little bit about wrangling my data. 
I have a data set stored on my file that I want to go ahead and load up into the Spark cluster, and I can do that with the SDF copy command. And then I'm going to use that lookup table to join it to my raw data to create a modeling data set that I'm going to use um, for my modeling. So let me run this, and you'll see that it'll go through here. Run all the dplyr command. If you haven't seen dplyr command, this might look complicated, but it's surprisingly easy to read, right? You can see exactly what I'm filtering, the new variables that are being created, the variables that I'm selecting, the joins that I'm making. These are not, these are not difficult um, queries to run. And you see when it's done, I have a new table that represents my uh, modeling data now. So I'm good, I've gotten all the information I need to build my models. I'm uh, on to my next step, which is modeling. Um, you can write this data out to file as well. I'm not gonna do that, it takes a long time. I'm just gonna go ahead and use this frame, which represents the exact same data set, but has already been uh, materialized uh, in Hive. So the first thing I'm gonna do is count the, those records, and we'll uh, verify that this is indeed about a, a billion records. So it's uh, 1.18 billion records. Um, and then uh, I wanna start doing some investigation and exploratory data analysis. So I'm going to run all of the visualization commands in one um, quick click, and then I'll explain what's going on here. So what I did with the visualizations was I personally wrote uh, some simple wrappers in Spark SQL that went out and binned up the information, reduced it to a, a subset that was small enough to collect back and visualize appropriately. So this is going to go ahead and bin everything into buckets in, um, for the taxi data using uh, this function, and then I plot using this function. These are not, again, these are not complicated wrappers to, to write. And uh, here's, the, here's the first output. So this, these are all the pickups in the New York area. You can see the pickups in the two airports, here JFK and LaGuardia, um, also in um, Manhattan and certain areas of uh, Brooklyn. And then uh, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna look at uh, the fare amounts. You can see that the fare amounts uh, kind of end here at $50 a, a cab ride. And the tip amounts kind of end at around $10 a cab ride. So that tells me I don't really need to worry about this long tail ride. I can kind of cut things off at a smaller um, cutoff amount, which is what I do here in the rest of these um, uh, code pieces. If I go further and I take a look at the relationship between uh, tip and fare, this is again a scatter plot with some rays here that are kind of aligned to the percentage um, taxi fares of the 10, 15, 20% tips that people are making. And I can verify that just by overlaying some lines on it and say, yeah, that does line up with those percentages. I can also break that out by facets to say, okay, let's take a look at cash versus credit. And I see a lot fewer people are paying with cash than with credit. Uh, finally, there, I want to show you uh, this one that uh, um, isn't done with a widget, but you can see the wrapper here. Again, dplyr is going to push all the computation to Spark. You're going to collect the data back here, and then you're going to plot it on um, Leaflet, which gives you some nice interactivity right inside the notebook. The pickup um, for this analysis is in um, uh, JFK Airport, and the top 25 drop-offs are mostly um, in Manhattan, uh, including, and there's one in LaGuardia. If you come down here, you can zoom in, you can take a look at this pickup, and this pickup is on Wall, uh, I'm sorry, not pickup, drop off, this drop off is on Wall Street. Great, so that's kind of the visualization. We've now, you know, munged our data, we've uh, visualized our data. We really wanna run some models. So in preparation to do some models, we're gonna do a little bit more um, transform, transforming of our data, and I'll explain what that looks like. We're going to um, partition our data into test and train and we're going to cache that data, and um, we're gonna include these filters here based on our previous observations, and then we're gonna run a model. So the nice thing about these models are that they use uh, familiar R syntax, so if you look at this model formula, that's what you would expect to see in any other R model. Well, I take that back, not any other R model, but some of the older R models. Um, and then uh, here's the summary method that we built on top of this as well and it looks like our uh, output because we uh, programmed it to be that way. Uh, on the NOVA table, if you look at uh, type credit, you'll see that this is by far the most significant variable, which means that uh, people who uh, pay in credit pay more than people that pay in, in uh, cash, or at least uh, the reported tips are more. I'm not sure which one is which. 
And then once you're done with building that model, you can go ahead and predict the test data set using SDF predict and take a look at some of the outputs using the visualization wrappers that I wrote, including a residual plot. Um, residual plots always look kind of goofy when you have these uh, strict delimiters in your data. And then uh, you know, a somewhat bell-shaped uh, normal plot, I'm sure we could do much, much better models if we tried a little harder. Okay, so that is um, uh, Sparkly R with ML models. I wanna talk a little bit more about the, the extensions. I'm gonna use uh, H2O as an example for an extension. If I come back here, um, I, H2O already has an R package, right? And they have uh, this way to run in Spark, um, in Spark called Sparkling Water. Um, and they're uh, you know, used um, on top of the Hadoop stack as well. All they're really lacking is a way to translate the data from Spark into um, H2O. And that's uh, where they use the R um, Sparkling package extension. What they did is they used this invoke command, if you can see over here that's highlighted, to uh, call another existing function called as h2o.frame, and that basically copies the data from one um, format to another format. So let's go ahead and do that. Here I convert my uh, trips and tests into another format, and I'm going to run a model uh, in uh, a GLM model. Um, and it gives me a little progress bar and some nice output. So, so one thing that H2O does here is uh, they give you some really nice output and um, the, you, know, you can kind of see some more things about your data, which can be very useful. Um, you can also have access to other things in H2O like um, their deep learning, right? Because they have deep learning functions. So we can run that model as well. And again, keep in mind here, I'm exploring the idea of, uh, you know, as an R user, what tools are available to me. And so that's, uh, that's uh, an extension. All right, so now I've run ML, I've run uh, H2O. Um, if I take a look at the data and I just count the number of records in the data, notice that my billion records have come down to um, one million records now. And that's because I've filtered the data, I've subsetted the columns, I've uh, partitioned it into test and train. And this is not terribly unusual, that by the time you go from your, what we might call, what statisticians might call raw data, you know, or your um, normalized data, to your model, what you would call your modeling data set, there's multiple magnitudes of order that have reduced that data down. So here, um, basically, I'm using very fancy techniques to run on a million records, but I can also just collect a million records back because that's not very big data. So I'm gonna go ahead and collect that back, and I'm gonna run another, yet another GLM in R for comparison stake, and I'm also going to run um, uh, regression, um, a regression tree using the uh, famous R part uh, library. So two more models that are done in R. And I get some nice output, all the tree output. This gives me warm fuzzies because I know, like, I've used this many times before for many years in R. And now I'm going to go uh, compare all these models. So I'm going to score my data. I'm going to uh, compute the mean squared error for each. And I'm going to summarize the table output. And uh, you can see here that um, the testing uh, MSE for deep learning is the um, smallest, followed by, followed by R part, and then the GLMs all have the exact same um, MSE, which is good, right, because they should give you the same result, they're the exact same model. Finally, I want to take all my learning, I wanna communicate that out to my group, so I, I um, summarize it in a table like this, and again, you can see the GLMs all have the same MSE, and the other two um, are slightly lower, and I'm gonna hit the preview button, and this renders this document into an HTML document that I can now um, you know, share with other people. With the click of a button. So this is RStudio Connect. And here uh, we can see this document. We can go through it. Other people can see it. If I click on everyone, everyone in the world can see it. If I just want to do it with the people that are in my group, maybe I choose logged in users. And then if I click open solo, this uh, URL now is accessible to anyone in, in, in the world to you know, see the work that I did. 
and they can see both uh, the text, the description, plus my code to reproduce the work. And if they want to, uh, they can download the R Markdown format here and then just load it up into the R Studio IDE and um, make any improvement or changes to it. So just in concluding things here, we've got um, you know, this question of you know, where should I model my data? And we, we covered uh, MLlib, which the, benef the real benefit to MLlib is that you don't have to move your data, right? And it's scalable, it's right there in Spark. Um, you've got H2O, which uh, you know, can be useful if you're using H2O, has a couple added algorithms that you might prefer. Um, and then the last one is R, where you would collect that back into R. But of course, uh, R only scales so much, which isn't a whole lot. But in some cases, you might not need that scale. There are others here that I didn't compare. And I think the other speakers have uh, pointed out that uh, the machine learning uh, topic is still unfolding. I've been an analyst for a, a long time. And I'm extremely excited to see all the development in um, big data analytics and all the improvements that are being made there. Uh, that's very, very encouraging. So I'm excited to see how this unfolds going forward. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Sparkly R and uh, what's new in Sparkly R. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, it's because it's a brand new package. It came out about uh, five months ago on CRAN. And uh, we released uh, the latest update, uh, 0.5 release, in uh, January um, of this year. And the January release had some nice things I didn't cover in the demo. Uh, one is a whole new uh, set of functions that make uh, quantitative analysis using the R syntax a lot easier in Spark. And I can see that uh, going, uh, being the story for every future release with Sparkly R. Uh, another thing that we did is we added an experimental package called, or support for um, Livy, um, and it's an experimental function. Livy is a REST-based uh, um, API that you can use for using your RStudio desktop with the Spark cluster. I was showing you um, RStudio um, server on the driver node, but we at RStudio are very are keenly aware that the vast, the lion's share of the majority of the people that use the ID are using the desktop. So it's important to us that we allow people to use the desktop to also have access to Spark. And uh, Livy is an experimental feature. If you want to try it out, um, it's documented on our site. We also got certified on Cloudera, which is uh, nice. A lot of our customers use Cloudera. And we've put together a really nice, we put a lot of enhancements on the um, Spark uh, uh, um, support site, the Sparkly R uh, website. So I would encourage you to go to the Sparkly R website. We put a cheat sheet on there, and that's a great way to get an overview of how to get started. There's also a lot of demos on how to write uh, dplyr with Spark, uh, run machine learning, algorithms and build your own extensions. And that's it, thank you. All right, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm sure we're gonna have a couple questions. Let's go ahead and start down here and I'll make my way to the right. Um, does the Connect, the Spark Connect have support for like Kerberos enabled clusters and different, you know, users and group permissions and stuff with Sentry and all that? Um, the, yeah, around the, the, the Kerberos. So if, yeah, if you're, if you're using, um, uh, are you using Kerberos right now with, yeah. your, with your cluster? Yeah, yeah, we should talk. But yeah, it, it's, it supports that. We, we certified that on Cloudera specifically. Are you using Cloudera by any chance? Yeah, yeah, then it, it should work. Um, if, yeah, if you want to have a chat about that, yeah, we can talk. Next question. Hi, I was just curious about um, how this, I guess, works, I guess, in standalone mode, maybe, or yeah. just, because I know you mentioned that um, most R users use this on desktop, and your demo was with the driver, but um, in general, like, people can just download Spark and start playing around with it, like, on their own machine. Yep. So are you saying that this is kind of meant for, like, sort of if you're using a remote machine or, you know, like a cloud? We, we, we support all deployment modes um, and definitely standalone. So one thing that I we didn't really talk about here is you can install Spark locally to get started, which I think you mentioned. That, that's a version of standalone mode, right? So, so that's, that's a great way to get um, up and running on, on Spark. 
If you have a standalone cluster, um, it's actually even easier to configure than Yarn. Um, you just point it to the IP and it'll run just fine. Sorry, could you just clarify that comment you made then about most users using their PC? Because I guess I interpreted that as maybe you couldn't use uh, Sparkly R locally. So, so if you're, so, so we normally recommend that you put Sparkly R and R on the driver node if you're gonna be in a cluster format. And the reason why is because there's a lot of communication that goes on with those APIs and that gives you the best performance. Um, in Yarn mode, you have to do that. Like, you don't have a choice. If you're going to do um, a Spark uh, standalone cluster and you want to link that up to another, um, you know, R Studio server that's outside the cluster, um, I've seen people do that. Uh, I, again, I hesitate to, to recommend, um, you know, disjoining those too much. I think you're going to, like, pay a, a big price well, for Well, I guess I'm just wondering, let's say I'm just an individual. I don't have a cluster. I just have my machine. So yep. I download Spark and, you know, I plan right. to use in standalone mode. Like... Our, our recommendation is to use uh, uh, RStudio server, put on the driver node, even in, even in standalone mode. Uh, you'll, you'll get the best performance that way, and it'll be the easiest setup. The um, RStudio server is uh, free and paid. I happen to be showing you the paid version, but it, the free version looks identical, just doesn't have as many features. Cool, thank you. Uh, thank you for this. A couple of questions. Uh, first one is, what do you guys think of the other Spark R effort going on uh, from the, you know, the group itself, from the Spark group itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're going to meet in the parking lot after this and <laughs> yeah, have a rumble. No, we, we've been in the communication with the Spark R guys. So I, I think for, to understand our studio's motivation, you have to understand uh, a couple of things. So one is, you know, we're, we're a very small group, right? There's only 50 of us right now. Another thing is that we are very um, interested in anything that will promote um, R. So, you know, anything that is um, good for the R community, we're, we're our thumbs up on. So, um, does that answer your question? Sort of. I mean, I think I'm more getting at the approach of the implementation choices, right? Sort of. I think you're using dplyr as sort of an yeah. interface versus sort of, I think, them building a library, a completely new library on top, right? And right. Uh, so I was sort of wondering, like, are there benefits to having multiple options? Sure, you could argue that, but... I mean, my, my instinct is that it's still very early days here, right? And uh, not just for um, R and Spark, but, but for Spark as well. Um, I think uh, Spark R has its own history, right? Of like how it started and its approach and, and, uh, and then the, the recent developments are being made now. Um, Sparkly R is a brand new package too. And I, I think I, I like the approach we've taken because it basically means that if you know R, and you have Spark, you can go to today to download from CRAN, you can test things out in local mode, you can use dplyr, you get the full support of the IDE, you're ready to go. Now, you know, does it do everything? No, I mean, it's mostly geared towards integrating with that Spark SQL API and running, um, you know, a, a lot of the models in Spark ML. But, I mean, let's, let's, be, let's be honest here, the, the Spark universe is, is pretty big, right? And we're only talking about, you know, parts of that universe right now. Um, and growing parts. So I think if our, um, you know, Spark R continues to grow and Sparkly R continues to grow, there's going to be more and more overlap between those two. But I'm not really worried about that right now, right? Like what I'm more concerned about is the fact that there are um, data scientists at organizations that I talk to every day that say I don't have access to my, my Hadoop cluster because I don't, you know, know Java or I'm not allowed to, you know, access it for these reasons. Um, that's a much bigger concern of mine. And I think that was really the real motivation for getting Sparkly R out there to make sure that people that are using R have a very easy way to get started with Sparkly R. I mean, with Spark. <laughs> people that use R have a very easy way to get used to getting started on Spark, using Sparkly R. Cool. I think we have time for one more question, if there's any. So just to continue the theme about mm. Spark R versus Sparkly R, I think the big feature that Spark R has that Sparkly R doesn't at the moment is being able to pass user-defined functions. So is that on the roadmap for Sparkly R? 
Yeah, that's kind of that, that's what I kind of alluded to with the expanding universe, right? I mean, our first uh, crack at the whip was to support the Spark API with the dplyr, um, and or the the Spark SQL API was the you know like the, the chief target. Uh, if it turns out that uh, we need to support um, R inside the cluster, like we can certainly we can certainly talk about that, right? Um, if it makes more sense, you know, to team up with Spark R to do that, I, like, I think there's a. That's why I was saying like it's early days. I think there's a lot of routes that we can go here. The chief one is that we just make sure that the R community is part of this uh, overall uh, Spark story. All right. With that, let's give them another hand, and I think it's Thank time you. for lunch. Thank you. So.